This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today I will be welcoming the legendary Bruce Belland. Bruce was the lead singer of the classic musical group The Four Preps, best known for their classic hits 26 Miles, Santa Catalina, and Big Man. They uh, were pretty popular back in the late 50s, early 60s. They were uh, regulars on the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. They were in the beloved classic comedy Gidget. They just had a great um, little stream of success there. And then after they broke up, Bruce uh, formed a, uh, a duo with um, Diamond Dave Somerville, and they were regulars on the Tim Conway show. And then Bruce uh, became a producer of um, game shows. He had a, a production company. He even uh, co-wrote and co-produced the 1986 underrated cult classic Weekend Warriors, which I used to watch on USA Up All Night as a kid. And it's going to be a, an honor to talk to him today. The uh, man is just a legend, and... It's going to be a great conversation as March Madness is wrapping up. So yeah, here is my interview with Bruce Belland. Hello. Hello, Bruce. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? Well, I'm fine. Thank you. You don't have to call me sir. I'm not an officer. I'm an enlisted man, so <laughs> Bruce is fine. <laughs> Sorry, it's a force of habit. <laughs> You've been raised by good parents, I guess. You're very polite. Uh, Anyways, don't, sir, it's not necessary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and yes, I was raised by very good parents. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, my pleasure. I, lo I love talking to people like you who want to talk about <clears throat> what I'm about. So uh, how can you say no to that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so going back in time, I was uh, reading that uh, your father was a minister, your mother was a, a gospel radio singer, and that you got your first taste of um, music when um, you were only four years old. You sang your first uh, solo at the morning worship service. Uh, do you have any memory of that? Oh, I have a very vivid memory of it. Not only what I remember, but I the story was told to me by my parents, sort of friends of the family for years about my my first solo and my wisecrack at the end of it. I don't know if I don't know what you've read, so if you haven't read the book you may not know the whole story. Yeah, I sang God Bless America and I had made a deal with my father before that solo, that first solo of mine, that yeah. if I sang it through without a mistake he'd give me a kiss my own stick of chewing gum and that was a big deal. Because I had a brother, and we'd always put a piece of chewing gum, get a lousy half. So I was really motivated. I got up and sang God Bless America live on, on the radio. And when I got to the last line, I said, My home, sweet home, where's my gum? <laughs> and of course, the whole congregation broke up and laughed and applauded. And my dad hugged me, and my mom was smiling. So that's it. I just, okay, that's it. I'm four years old. I know what I want to be. I want to be a singer. <laughs> uh, well, you're in good company because guys like Sammy Davis Jr. and Jerry Lewis, you know, when the first time they ever uh, performed when they were like five years old, they remembered it till the day they died, you know. Yeah, that's right. It, it's a profound time in your life, you know. And uh, I talked at one point, George Burns was kind of my mentor. He began at age five. Uh, in vaudeville with the Pee Wee Quartet. Right. <laughs> or little five-year-old kid singing. So, yeah, you, you don't forget those first times, you know. <laughs> it, absolutely. Uh, you are born and raised in L.A.? No, I was not born and raised in L.A. I was born and raised from the first ten years of my life in Chicago, where my father was a minister, and then he accepted uh, the ministry of a church in West Hollywood. So at ten, ten years of age, I and my family drove Route 66, in a 10-year-old Ford out to the magic Hollywood. And um, there I was suddenly, who I'd lived in Chicago for 10 years, listening to the radio, singing along with Bing Crosby, wanting more than anything to be in show business. But how does that happen in a suburb of Chicago? And suddenly I find myself living in West Hollywood, a block off the Sunset Strip. So it was a magical time for me. Talk about things you don't forget, Tommy. <laughs> that, that certainly is one of my first days driving down Sunset Boulevard past movie studios and Hollywood and Vine and all that. It was uh, 
it was a life changer for me. So yes, I was born in Chicago. I'm a proud native born Chicagoan, but uh, when I was 10, we moved out here and my life turned into magic just by virtue of geography and where I was now living. Right, because uh, you, you delivered newspapers to a lot of iconic movie stars like Jimmy Stewart, Lucille Ball, George Burns, Russell and Russell. Did you interact with any of them? Oh, yeah. I had a wonderful conversation one day with Gene Kelly. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to throw his newspaper as I drove down the street on my bike delivery newspapers, and it never landed very much near the porch. So one day he came out as I had just thrown his paper and came over to talk to me. I was on the bridal path where I, you ride your bike down the <clears throat> bridal path in the middle of Rodeo Drive. <clears throat> Long story short, he tutored me for about 10 minutes in the proper way to fold the newspaper, the proper way to put the rubber band on it, the proper way to keep your wrist flexible and loose as you throw the, throw it to the porch. And he, he showed me, he grabbed the paper, he folded it the way he said it should be folded, put the rubber band on, yeah. threw it, and landed about a foot from his front door. <laughs> and I used to land under the bush in his front yard. So <clears throat> that was interesting. He taught me a little thing like folding and throwing a newspaper can be approached creatively and, and with imagination and energy, and, and you make it better. So, you know, that was one. I had a long talk one day in the driveway with the comedy legend Jimmy Durante, mm -hmm. who was in his bathroom with his slippers. He'd come out to get his morning paper, and there I was. And I had a brand-new bicycle, so he and I talked about the bicycle. <laughs> and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I would run into the stars uh, constantly. Uh, you may not know who he is, but a man named Gene Herschel, who was oh, yeah. made out there. Dr. Christian for years uh, used to give me a fruitcake every Christmas. I can't stand fruitcake, but I never had the heart to tell him. So I was a little blonde-haired uh, delivery boy all of 14 years of age uh, from West Hollywood, which is across the tracks. We were a blue-collar working-class community of little cottage homes. And here I was driving down Rodeo Drive delivering papers of Gene Kelly and Lucille Ball. So that was, uh, that was quite a culture shock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Gene Herschel, he has an award uh, named after him. Yeah, Oscar, yes. I, in fact, my brother-in-law won that award about three years ago. Yeah, the Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award. Uh, yeah. Yeah. My man, he started the Screen Actors Guild, and he also founded, created the Motion Picture Country Home, which is about 10 minutes from me here in Woodland Hills. And he was, he was a wonderful man. Wow. But his fruit, but his fruit cake was not very good. <laughs> <laughs> So you grew up listening to Bing Crosby and the Mills Brothers. Did you also listen to musicians that kind of got rock and roll started, like, you know, around around the early 50s, Jackie Brinston did Rock at 88? No, I think if I had a bit of it, it may not, to a purist, it may not be considered rock and roll, but my earliest influence other than straight pop was doo-wop, so... You know, I knew all the still of the night and the penguins with G. And so if I did listen to music other than the pop stuff and Bing Crosby, it would be the doo-wop harmony groups. Uh, so that, they were a big influence on us. In fact, our very first release, which looked like it was going to be a hit, Dreamy Eyes, was a doo-wop recording, very doo-wop. So they were our strongest influences. Bing Crosby just influenced me in terms of singing technique and rhythm and interpretation. He was just, just a real hero of mine. Nice. So, so you and uh, Glenn Larson knew each other in junior high, and then you got to high school, and then you guys decided to start the four preps? That's right. I didn't know Glenn in junior high. I went to grammar school with Glenn, so I knew him from then. Mm -hmm. And in junior high, I went to one junior high, he went to another for complicated reasons. Anyhow, then we ended up rejoining again from elementary school, rejoining again at Hollywood High. Yeah, and there was a student talent show, which is always a big deal at Hollywood High every year. Talent scouts from everywhere would come to look for new talent. And he said, hey, you know, the groups are popular for me. Actually, I approached him and I said, you want to start a group and audition for the show? <clears throat> so we got two guys out of the choir and we auditioned. And since we were the only boys that showed up to audition, everybody else were girls, they, they put us on the show. So we weren't called the four preps at that time, Tommy. We were just four guys from the school choir who sang Shaboom on the show. Mm -hmm. And once we went over so well at the show, uh, the two guys we'd hired from the choir were going to graduate. One was going in the Navy, one was going away to college, so we needed to find two regulars. And that's when we got lucky and got Marv Ingram and Ed Cobb. And uh, that became the original foursome, and at a show 
a week or two after that talent show, we call, we found the name The Four Preps, and that was it. <laughs> did you guys have instant chemistry, or did, did it take a while? Uh, Glenn and I had instant chemistry. That's a good question. Glenn and I had uh, a chemistry because we had gone in our senior year. We both, I was elected head cheerleader, and Glenn was a cheerleader with me. Mm -hmm. uh, we ran track on the track team. He handed it off to me. We broke a school record. Uh, we hung around in school choir together, but mainly we took a drama class together. And the drama class, you constantly, each week you had to get up and do a sketch or a skit or some kind of dramatic presentation. He and I immediately struck it off with our senses of humor, and we began to do all the Carl Reiner, Sid Caesar routines from the show of shows. Yeah. <laughs> and for the drama class. Well, of course, they were getting up and doing scenes from On the Waterfront and Othello, you know, so here we are doing <laughs> stick from Sid Caesar's show, but the kids loved it, and he and I started comedically clicking right away. We just, we thought alike. And uh, he was more or less the straight man when it set up my goofiness, you know. Yeah. So we had a chemistry. Ed Cobb and I had a chemistry even before that because when I was 10, he moved in across the street from me, and from age 10 or so on, we would sit on the front porch with our ukuleles for hours and sing and harmonize on all kinds of songs. And then we'd go out to the front lawn and throw the football around, the baseball, and we double dated and went to proms together. So again, my chemistry with Glenn and Ed was very strong and long. Uh, Marv Ingram was the guy that I didn't know much about, and after seeing him with him for 20 years, I didn't know much more about him. But uh, he was the fourth guy. He was just a magnificent singer, of the best singer I've ever stood next to. But uh, So three of the four of us, yeah, had a chemistry, and quickly with Marv, he started a student production at school called Beat Me in St. Louis, and he was fabulous. He was funny and sang great, so we went after him and got him, and that became the permanent lineup. Yeah, I mean, you guys had this this, this mixture of um, rockabilly, gospel, and you guys had four port four four part har vocal harmonies long before the Beach Boys did. Oh yeah, in fact, you know, Brian says we sort of influenced him. We gave him an assembly at his school, and he was at Hawthorne High, and uh, you know, he credits us with kind of having an influence on what he did. Yeah, of course, we were influenced by groups that came before us: the Mills Brothers and the Four Freshmen, the Four Lads, the Four Aces, the. Qu Ames Brothers, so I was into the foursomes from a very early age. Yeah, did, did you guys uh, ever do shows with the four freshmen? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I got a picture in my den on the wall of uh, backstage in Las Vegas. Bob Flanagan, who was one of the founding members and the genius lead singer of the group for 40 years, mm -hmm. he was there with me and Jim Pike from the Letterman and David Somerville for the for the uh, Diamonds, and the four of us are in our dressing room in Vegas singing uh, It's a Blue World with Bob Flanagan. I say in the caption of the picture, here I am singing with God. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you guys get on Ozzy and Harriet? Uh, I went to school I went to school with Glenn and Ed, and in my senior year I got elected hair cheerleader, and I flunked so many classes because I was screwing around at being a cheerleader that I got set back a semester. So Glenn graduated and Ed graduated and went on and I stayed an extra semester and that's when I met Ricky Nelson. I had met David Nelson in the locker room. He was quarterback on the junior varsity. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I ran track. So he had a locker not far from me. We would talk now and then. I didn't really know him. And then one day he invited me, David did, to go up to her house, which is just two or three blocks from Hollywood High and shoot baskets which I did, so I kind of got to know him then, but there was no mention of the show at that time. Then Ricky came into Hollywood High when I was there for the extra semester. He and I became friends, took a couple of classes together, started to talk about music and so forth, and um, we, I graduated and went on and formed the preps, and shortly after he signed his recording contract, he called and said, would you guys be interested in coming on the show, play my fraternity brothers and backup singers? Well, you know, of course, we jumped at the chance. So it was really through my kind of halfway friendship with David. We were never close friends. But then my rather close and growing friendship with Ricky, that was the minute he got his recording contract, he loved everything about Elvis. So yeah. Elvis had a guitar with a leather you know, embroidered case on it. He would get a guitar with a leather embroidered case on it. If, if Elvis had four men singing behind him, he wanted four guys behind him. So the, we got the gig and became regulars on the show. Wow. Were they fun to do? I loved it. I loved it. After the preps, the preps did it for one season and then we got too busy. But I stayed on and did three or four more years and I, I just, I had the time of my life. It's a big part of my, my book. By the way, when we 
get a chance, I'd like to mention my book. But I write, there's a couple of chapters about Ozzy and Harry. It was an education for me. I learned more from Ozzy than, than I worked with George Burns and Dick Clark and all the greats. But Ozzy was, to me, one of the most civilized, uh, polite, and yet strong, controlling men. He, he was just a, a genius. I loved Harry, and I had a huge crush on her. Every young guy in the set had a huge crush on her. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had a bungalow on the set, so whenever we were on a scene shooting on the soundstage, we'd walk across the lot to this wonderful bungalow that Ozzy had provided for Ricky and us to learn an act. Mm. And it had drums and guitars and a full-stocked kitchen and donuts and Coca-Cola and record players. And we would go and hide away in the bungalow for hours and listen to Chuck Berry and all uh, and uh Carl Perkins and work out arrangements to go on tour together. So while we were shooting that first season on the show, we were between sets. We were we were uh, preparing an act to go on the on the road with with Ricky. Yeah. Do you remember where you were uh, when you when you found out that he had passed? Oh, absolutely. I was in the car out here in L.A. on the freeway heading to a New Year's party. And uh, my wife still talks about it. I just, I swung off the free, I turned around, made a U-turn and came back home. I, I sure wasn't in a mood to party. <laughs> yeah, that was awful. One of the, the worst tragedies ever. Absolutely. It shouldn't have happened. But, you know, I, he, was, he was in a crappy old, very used airplane. I don't know, you know, there's all kinds of stories about what caused it. But the point is the man is gone way too soon. Yeah. So were you guys already signed to uh, Capitol when you got on that show? Yep, yep. Yeah. We, uh, so we watched, you know, Ricky make records, and we would compare notes uh, after our sessions with him, and then he got a hit before we did. We thought, oh, well, you know, we were out traveling with him as his group, his backup, and seeing all the idol, att idolized attention he was getting, we thought, yeah, we got to get a hit so we can get some of this. So, yeah, he was he, he hit it before we did. Yeah. So you guys um, you guys get signed to Capitol, and you guys at first had some moderate hits with Dreamy Eyes and uh, Moonstruck in Madrid and Falling Star, but 26 Miles... It, that's the first huge hit that be, that that takes you guys off. Yeah, yep. That, yeah, that's it. And you you got the, you got the idea for that while you guys were body surfing, right? Well, you already done your homework. Huh? <laughs> I'm very <laughs> impressed. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Uh, I was going to summer school to, and to make up my geometry, which I failed twice. I wanted to go to UCLA, so I went to summer school to get my geometry. Uh, grade and I went from Sunset to hitchhike in the town to go to high school that day and all my buddies are on the other side of Sunset hitchhiking west to go to the beach. So I ran back down to the house. We only lived two blocks from Sunset. I got a towel and a ukulele and my bathing suit and went to the beach with the other guys. And after we'd been body surfing for a while, we were lying around on the sand just, you know, cooling out. And uh, somebody said, well, you can see Catalina. Somebody else said, oh yeah, man, it went like, what, 25, 26 miles? So for some reason, I picked up the ukulele and said, 26 miles across the sea, Santa Catalina is waiting for me. And I wrote a little bit of a song at that point and uh, put it away in a drawer and never did much with it. And we signed with Capital, and after six or seven releases that didn't sell, we've been trying to convince Capital for a solid year to let us record our silly little song. Mm. And all they would say is, Perry Como, Patty Page, Eddie Fisher, they don't write their songs. Songwriters write their songs. We'll get a songwriter to write you a hit. Well, we recorded songs by Burt Bacharach, and nothing happened. So finally, Capitol decided to let us record our little Catalina song, and there we go. Yeah, it's a beautiful song, and it still holds up. I know, it's interesting. Well, very early on, before I wrote it, a songwriter told me, he said, if you get a chance, write a song about a place. And if you can't, write it about a place that people love. You know, I love Paris, New York, New York, Chicago, San Francisco. Make it about a place people love. Well, I didn't write the song for that reason, but the fact is a lot of people love Catalina. So the song's not going away because Catalina's there. They get over a million visitors a year now. And the cruise ship stop there and so forth. And I got a big kick out of it. I have a friend who was born and raised on Catalina who's the greeter when people come off the cruise ships. He told me the other day that people come off these cruise ships from all around the world, you know, wearing turbans and so forth, singing 26 miles. So, <laughs> the words kind of spit all over the world. I mean, I've heard this song in Bangkok and Manila and Brussels, so yeah, it's been good to me. 
Yeah, and then the follow-up, Big Man, uh, where did that come from? Well, when, Cap, when we were on the road and uh, 26 Miles started to race up the charts, our, our producer from Capitol called and said, you guys have got a hit, get ready and write a follow-up. And we were so busy being thrilled about our hit, he said, you know, stop patting yourself on the back, get your guitars out, write another follow-up, because when 26 Miles starts to fade, we got to have it ready. So Glenn and I worked night after that. We were on the road in Oklahoma City performing at an amusement park. It was during the summer. And we went back and wrote it. Uh, the, we, we sat down with our guitars that night. I said, okay, let's get an idea for a song. Somehow somebody brought the subject up. And Glenn and I could never remember which of us it was. But, you know, the expression on campus these days is a big man. He's a big man on campus. In fact, one... Uh, competing group he had had an album called BMOC with big men on campus so a very popular expression on colleges and high school campuses so we started messing around with big man I was a big man you made me a big man I want to be a big man and you know over two or three nights of working on it and reworking on it we came up uh, we came up with the whole song wow how did you guys get to be in Gidget uh, I'm damned if I know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, we were rehearsing one day, uh, and Mel Shower, our uh, manager, we were rehearsing at the Capitol Tower for a session. He came over and came walking in. He's a wonderful older gentleman. He was really old Hollywood, knew everybody in town. He was a terrific guy. And he came in and he said, I just got a call from Columbia Pictures. They bought the rights to Gidget. Well, we all knew what Gidget was because it was the best-selling book. Mm -hmm. A man named Frederick Coner, about a little girl who went to University High who wanted to be a surfer. I happened to know her and a lot of kids at Uni High. They were kind of our sister high school. So we knew the book and we knew Gidget's popularity with the teenagers and stuff. We were dying to be in a movie. And he, Mel said, well, Columbia Call, I want to know if you guys are available. I gave him the dates. You guys are in town, blah, blah, blah. Keep your fingers crossed. Well, a day or two later, we got a call. You got it. You got co-star billing. You're going to sing the opening song over the opening credits. You're going to have your own scene in the middle of the, of the movie. So that's how it happened. Wow. Yeah. Was it fun? Oh, God. Oh, man. It was so much fun. Except I made a complete fool of myself. I had a huge crush on Sandra D. Yeah. When we got signed to do the movie, I was bragging that all the guys in the band, I'm going to, I'm going to get a thing going with her. Well, the first couple of days I tried to say hello to her, I couldn't work up my nerve. The third day, I turned around in the hallway to, to say hi, and I bumped her in a water fountain and fell on my ass. <laughs> so she came running over, are you okay? Are you okay? So that was my introduction to Sandra D, which is not a very smooth way to kick things off. But yeah, it was a great experience. I loved the director, a man named Paul Wencos, mm -hmm. who became a friend of mine in later years. Uh, uh, Cliff Robertson was just pure class, just an absolute gentleman. He introduced me to mint flavored dental floss, so I owe I all to Cliff Robertson. <laughs> Jimmy Jaron was cool and smooth, very charismatic. Sandra D. She was just absolutely adorable. There were several guys in the in the cast, just you know, extras that went on to successful careers themselves. So uh, it was a, it was a fun gang. Best two weeks of my life. I really enjoyed it. That was Doug McClure. There's Joby Baker. Well, listen to you, <laughs> uh, Joby Baker. Yeah, Joby Baker. Uh, and yeah, and you know who else was in it? Um, yeah, the guy that made Billy Jack. Oh, uh, Tom Laughlin. Thank you. He was in it. Uh, Burt Metcalf was in it, who produced all 11 seasons of MASH. Oh, okay. Doug McClure, Joby Baker. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> it was a fun bunch. And the funny thing is, you know, we grew up on Malibu. Well, you know, that's where I wrote the song was on the sand at the beach there. But they never shot any of our scenes at the beach. The one where we played Gidget in the middle of the, or Cinderella in the middle of the movie was shot on the stage at Columbia, and they put in truckloads of sand mm -hmm. and put it all over the floor, which one, of course, had to be swept up after the scene was shot. I never figured out why. It must have been cheaper, I guess, than taking a whole crew out to Malibu and doing it. But a lot of their stuff was shot at the beach, of course, the surfing things and all. I never could figure that one out. Yeah. <laughs> So you you guys do a letter to the Beatles, and they threaten to sue you guys, right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should have let them sue us. It would have been an honor, I think. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we made a reputation satirizing all kinds of things, from Elvis to you name it. And uh, we 
did whatever was popular. And so when the Beatles came along, well, let's get the Beatles and Beatlemania. We didn't kid their music. I love their music. I, I'm still their number one fan. And I am convinced, Tommy, that uh, they never heard the record. I don't think they would have taken umbrage at all. It was tongue-in-cheek. It was cute. And it wasn't about the Beatles, per se. It was about Beatlemania and marketing the Beatles. But somebody in their... And I, I've been told it was Brian Epstein, the, their manager, just said, this puts them in a bad light. This is a bad way to, uh, you know, represent them to American audiences. We don't like it, and we're going to sue you for defamation. I don't think they would have won, but because uh, I think a judge would say it's satire. Everybody does satire. Live with it, you know. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah. And the Phil Capital stopped the record immediately. They pulled it off all the stations. They pulled it out of the record stores. And this is kind of interesting. Capital was so terrified of upsetting the Beatles that I got a letter a couple of weeks after they pulled the record from a lady in Australia mm-hmm. who was a secretary at the Capital Pressing Plant in Sydney, Australia. And in the letter, she explained that she'd come back from lunch recently with her, all her girlfriends from the secretarial pool, and they were all ordered to report downstairs to the basement. And when they got down there in their high heels and skirts and everything, they had it sledgehammers and told to spend the afternoon smashing to smithereens the 2,045 records of letters of the Beatles that were scattered on the floor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that's really being a, that's really being scared of a record. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think it's a funny song. I don't think you guys were trying to be malicious or anything. I think it's it's a it's a funny good it's a good song. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, it was uh, it was fun to make, and you know, you probably would have given us a few more years in our career, but we you know, we were already seeing the writing on the wall with the le- the British invasion and the Beatles and Motown, and we were all involved by then and other things. So uh, you know, it, it died a graceful kind of a decline at the end, and we just you know in '69 we said, okay, that was fun, and and then we got back together again 20 years later. But that's another book. <laughs> Yeah. In 1969, you guest starred on It Takes a Thief. How did that come about? Did I have guest starred on It Takes a Thief? Yeah, I guess I did. Yeah. But where did you find that out? It's on IMDb. You play a character named Raul. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's a bit... Oh, that's funny. Let me hold on here. Raul. Yeah, it says, uh, Guess Who's Coming to Rio. <laughs> that's the name of the episode. Guess? Coming to Rio. Coming to Rio. Well, you know, Glenn Larson of the Preps, with whom I wrote the hits and so forth, produced The Catch a Thief, and he created Magnum P.I. and Knight Rider and Fall Guy and McCloud. So he was a big producer, Mm -hmm. and he always thought from the day we got together in drama class that I was the funniest guy in the world. So out of the blue, he called me. Do you have any idea what year that was? 69. Okay, 69, okay, well, I, was, I wasn't I was at NBC yet. A year later, I went to NBC, but 69, I was out performing with David Somerville in a act called Billund in Somerville, and he called me, he said, got a funny little vignette about a, a Hispanic chauffeur that drives this gorgeous lady uh, in a Rolls Royce and has a little conversation with her with some funny lines. Would you like to do it? I said, yeah, sure. I thought they cut it out. I didn't realize it ended up in the show. I, I, I thought it was so bad they took it out. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Bruce's not around to ask anymore, but I'll have to check that out. See, you haven't seen the episode, I assume. No, not that okay. one. And it, it says here Terry Garr was in that episode, too. Oh, yeah, well, Glenn really was the guy, like, the guy that discovered Terry Garr, and Jacqueline Smith, for that matter, yeah. Wow. So, so after the four uh, preps break up, uh, you and Diamond Dave Somerville um, begin doing a musical comedy act. Uh, what, so how did that come about? Well, the last year that the preps were together, Ed Cobb, our original bass, left the group. He was the first one to leave. By then, he had produced a lot of big hit records and written some hits, and he was on another career path. So we got Diamond Dave Somerville, who had left the Diamonds long before that, was doing a single as a folk singer. We got him to join the preps as the bass, replacing Ed Cobb. We went on tour to Asia and Europe and so forth, and then in 69, by that time, being on stage together for a year, David and I had developed a really strong chemistry. And Glenn was looking around to go to producing and so forth. We were all kind of losing momentum in the group. And our agents kept saying, you and David Somerville, do an act. We can get you guys booked. You guys are, you do comedy, you sing crazy. I mean, it, this, come on. 
So we formed Bill and in Somerville and actually debuted on The Tonight Show. Yeah. And in the first six months, we did 33 network television spots. The secret of Bill and in Somerville is what? If we work with the Smothers Brothers, we do music. If you work with the Righteous Brothers, we do comedy. So we could do comedy and music. So we ended up working with Johnny Mathis, Dion Warwick, Brazil 66, Henry Mancini, uh, you know, all, all the great artists that were represented by our agency. Mm-hmm. And we had a lot of fun. We, we worked at the Coconut Grove. We worked at the Greek Theater and were pretty successful. And then through a change of circumstances, which are a leather long story, I ended up getting an offer from NBC to become a programming executive there, and David was off making records with his girlfriend, and we were kind of slowing down and not going on the road as much, and we just kind of looked around, and I got this offer, and so we split. But for three or four years that we were together, it was we were regulars on a Tim Comedy, Kim Conway comedy hour. In fact, someone just sent me a new YouTube entry for the Tim Comedy Show in which David and I sing, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> by the way, if you would email me, I'd like to get you on my mailing list for my monthly newsletter. It's absolutely free, but it's all about all these. Sure. And in this in this last one, I dedicated it to the Ukraine and the song, he ain't heavy, he's my brother, about the Ukrainians are our brothers, they're not heavy, we got to help them. So I included the video of, uh, of us doing this David and I doing the song in the show with the newsletter about Ukraine. So I, I'd like you to see it. Anyhow, that was one of the high points. We did 13 weeks on his show, and um, it was a great experience. David became my dearest lifelong friend. I worked with him off and on for a long time. As a matter of fact, curiously enough, David was known as the Diamond. He was Diamond Dave. Mm-hmm. He was a prep for exactly twice as long as he was the Diamond. He was the Diamond for seven years. He was a prep for 15. So uh, he's, he was a long time colleague yeah well you guys made that tonight show uh, appearance was it well received yeah it really was yeah it, it was back in new york of course and uh yeah it, it, it really kicked us off and then that's when we started to get all the offers to do other shows uh yeah it was uh but pretty but, exciting <laughs> but, but but johnny liked you guys johnny wasn't there that night jerry lewis guest hosted oh <laughs> how's jerry well, I'm, I'm, uh, another funny story. Uh, we were going to be on the first night. Of course, I call everybody I knew, including all the girls I ever dated in high school. We're going to be on the Tonight Show Monday night. Mm-hmm. Well, we all watched Monday night. Jerry Lewis, being Jerry Lewis, ran way over. We couldn't get on. At the end of the show, so I got to apologize to Bill and to Somerville. They were in the wings waiting to entertain you. Gosh, we ran long. I'm so sorry. Fellas, can you come back to, you, they can come back tomorrow night? Bill and to Somerville, tomorrow night here on the Tonight Show. Good night. Next time he was... He, he runs long again. So on Tuesday, I said, oh, boy, it happened. I just feel terrible. These guys have been so great about it. We're picking up our hotel bill, but they're, they're, they're going to be on for sure tomorrow night. So Wednesday, we're standing on the street corner in Times Square waiting to, for the light to cross and walk to the studio, and David's got a guitar case. And the New York guy comes and says, what, you guys some kind of musicians? He said, yeah, yeah, we're, uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to be in the, the Tonight Show. He said, Tonight Show, are you guys Bellin in Somerville? <laughs> they haven't been on the show yet, but you know, two weeks, two nights of uh, praise from Jerry Lewis. You knew who you were. It was, yeah, it was fun. It was a great experience. It did, it did us a lot of good. And uh, Tim Conway uh, passed away last year. What, what was what was he like? I uh, I couldn't tell you. I, uh, Tim was a very guarded guy. Tim was very unsettled by anything that was emotional or sentimental or earnest or sincere. He always had a little bit of an edge. He just was not comfort with, comfortable with open uh, warmth, I guess is the way you put it. An enormously funny man, I mean, God. But uh, I, I didn't know him well. Interestingly enough, his daughter went to high school with my daughter. We lived near each other in Encino, and they were very dear friends, and she just wrote a book about him about uh, Tim that my daughter read and told me about uh, called My Dad's Funnier Than Your Dad. And uh, so oh, yeah. I knew Tim it, it, more through our daughters that, you know, hung out together than I did Tim on the set. He's not a guy to mix around at the, you know, at the donut table and make small talk. He's very closed and kind of private. And as I say, not not, not very warm, but if you ever watch the show, all his introductions to, to us were, were smart-ass. Yeah. For, 
For example, he'd say, you know, sometimes you go to a nightclub somewhere with you, a little place out of the way and you're with your wife and you see two guys just knock you out. And you say to yourself, well, if, boy, if I ever have a show, I'm going to have them on my show. Well, that didn't happen with these next two guys. They were forced on me by a high-pressure agent, ladies and gentlemen, Bellin in Somerville. So that's how he would introduce us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's interesting to hear. Yeah, because I've heard nothing but good things about the guy, but that's that's interesting to hear. Well, he was a nice man. Don't get me wrong. He never did anything, you know, uh, unpleasant or, or in any way. He just was not comfortable being super friendly. So when people asked him what was he really like, all I know is he was very funny. He showed up on time. He did a great job, and he was always nice to us. He just, and we were terribly miscast on the show. I mean, you'll see in the newsletter I write about it. We were troubadours, you know, in these fancy poetic Shakespearean outfits singing in heavy he's my brother, followed by a pie-in-the-face comedy sketch. You know, it made no sense at all. So I can understand why we didn't work on the show. <laughs> so so you you go into uh, producing. Uh, what, 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 um, did you enjoy doing that? Well, I did. I did to a degree, Tommy, but I, you know, I did some celebrity game shows and I would be standing, you know, on the set briefing Dion Warwick and Peter Lawford and stuff on, you know, what the shows are going to do and this and that. And I go back to my office, just making a lot of money, but I think, damn it, I want to be on that stick, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what else? I don't want someone else to do it. So I missed performing like crazy, and I got back into it by a fluke. But, uh, no, it, it was fun. It was enjoyable. I made good music, but it was not a uh, good uh, production. But uh, I wanted to be performing again. I really missed it terribly. I wrote a song during that time called What Would I Do Without My Music, mm -hmm. which I wrote while I was producing. And it just said, I want to get back to my music. It lifts my spirits. It fulfills me and enriches me. And what would I do without my music? So uh, it was good. It was fun. I made a lot of money. Uh, but uh, it got some Emmy nominations, but it couldn't come close to standing with three guys on the stage. <laughs> is, it, is it true you wrote the uh, the Wally World theme song in the first Vacation movie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did that yeah. come about? Well, one of those crazy Hollywood things. Um, I, not, it, it, if, well, no, never mind. I've got a phone call coming in. I've got a family member in the hospital, I thought it might be that, but it's not. Um, I, we were, I was writing a Broadway show, I had quit Ralph Edwards where I produced all the television shows, and I was writing a Broadway show with a friend of mine, and we were holed up in our little studio in Hollywood one day when the phone rang, and I don't know how the hell they found out about us, but somebody in Warner Brothers said, blah, 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 movie, national, and Pluto vacation, yeah. we need a theme for Wally's World, we need, we need a Mickey Mouse Club theme sideways. In other yeah. words, the same kind of song. Uh, okay, I said, well, can you guys do that? Oh, yeah, we can handle that. Okay, tell us a little bit about the movie. Okay, Wally's World, Amusement Park, Chevy Chase. Okay, good deal. And he said, oh, buy one thing. We need it by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, oh, okay, and there's a paycheck involved here. We hung up and uh, spent the night, uh, pretty much all night, writing Wally's World theme. And... Uh, they were, it was such a kind of impersonal assignment that the next morning when we had it ready, we called Warner Brothers and said, it's ready. They said, okay, uh, someone will meet you at the gate, give them the song. So we went to the gate of Warner Brothers. We didn't even get to go inside and be greeted. So we were standing by the guard, you know, booth at the front gate, and this guy in a suit and tie is walking out, reaches through the, the fence, takes the, so the tape of the song and says, thank you very much, turns around and walks back to his office. So that was our <laughs> connection with making the movie uh, I, I grew up in the 90s watching USA up all night and uh, they used to show weekend warriors <laughs> you would bring that up yeah <laughs> uh, we're never going to live that one down <laughs> wh wh where did that idea come from as you know, a vocal group and a bunch of guys in the show business who were all in the same National Guard unit. Right. And the, it's about to hit the fan, and so they need to stage a spectacular uh, parade and demonstration for the ambassador from Russia so we don't get go to war. I mean, that's a nutshell. It happened to the four preps. We had a top ten record on the charts when we got activated in the National Guard and uh, flew back and forth to Vegas every night to perform with George Burns and then all day wore fatigues and cleaned latrines at the base. So this, it was all true. 
Well, when I first got the idea, I was uh, living in Encino and a member of the PTA at my daughter's school. And one evening after a PTA meeting, we all broke up. We're having coffee and donuts. And one of the women uh, neighbors who knew what I did said, what are you working on lately? I said, well, I'm trying to put a movie idea together for uh, Hollywood Air Force, I call it. It's about guys in show business at a big demonstration. And they fool a Russian ambassador with all their showbiz tricks, blah, blah, blah. She said, oh, what a great idea. Fade out five years later, that woman. A housewife from Encino was on the beach at Waikiki with her husband, having a vacation, and who should walk by but Bert Convy. She says, she's a lifetime Bert Convy fan. She adores him. She watches every show he's ever been on. Mm -hmm. She gets up and runs over and says, Mr. Convy, Mr. Convy, I'm such a fan. And they get talking. And she says, what are you doing? Uh, what are you up to these days? He says, well, I'm trying to direct a movie. I want to direct a movie. I've got all the financing, all the money available. I cannot find a script. I can't find a story. So our housewife from Encino says, a friend of mine wanted to rob about guys in show business, blah, blah, blah. And Bert says, how do I get a hold of this guy? He comes back from Hawaii, calls me, we have lunch. I pitch him about three sentences. He said, that's it, let's make a movie. Okay, we shook hands and there it was. Wow. It's just, it's just, it's, I know it's a true story. It's just hard to imagine a, a guy with your religious background, you know, doing a movie <laughs> with that kind of humor, <laughs> you know? Well, you know, part of what happened too, Todd, I can't, I can't take full blame, although I should take it for the major part. Yeah. But early on in the, in the, uh, in the show, in the filming, Bert Comedy says to the crew, I'll remember guys, this is their, this is the service. You're all a bunch of young, rough, tough guys in the service. So, you know, you want to throw in a little profanity here or that's okay. Well, they became fucking this and fucking that and up your ass and all this stuff and yeah. you know, eat shit. Oh, this stuff that I never wrote. Yeah. So, uh, I had to explain that to my preacher father. Actually, he didn't do anything about the movie. But, uh, you know, it, you know that, 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 it is what it is. Frankly, I always apologize for it one night just for the heck of it. My wife and I got it out and watched it. It wasn't. It has some funny scenes, and let's put it that way. It, it does. It's based on a true story. I mean, the book that I wrote. By the way, I got a book coming out. Let's talk about it before we say goodbye. Yeah, um, let's let's talk about the book about, be, because when I was doing my research on you, I couldn't like get any information on it. Is it out already? What? The, the warriors? You, no, your memoir. Oh no! Yeah, I, I'm, we're going after a publisher right now. We haven't got oh. a publisher yet. We're uh, it's all finished. We've got promotional photos. We've got uh, all kinds of uh, interviews lined up for it and stuff. We just uh, haven't gotten a publisher. We're just starting to submit. It's only been sent to one publisher, mm -hmm. someone in England who just uh, expressed an, an interest. But uh, it'll be coming out, and maybe we maybe we should talk again when it comes out. But if people want to go to my website, which is Bruce Belland. B R U C E B E L L A N D mm -hmm. dot com, Bruce Belland dot com. And on there is a category that says the book. Click on the book. You'll find a little bit about what it's about. Maybe I think there's a sample chapter or two. And if you want to be notified when it's released, you can enter your name on the website and you'll be notified when it comes out. It's called Icons, Idols, and Idiots Hollywood <laughs> My Adventures in America's First Boy Band. Wow. How long, did, how long did it take to write? Ten damn years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, it was one of those things that now and then I get to it when I could. And finally, when the pandemic hit, it was it, the only good thing about the pandemic was it forced me to stay home and quit having three-hour lunches with my pals and finish the damn book. So I finally got it done. But uh, I'm very proud of it. It's, uh, you know, it, it touches on every phase from the four-year-old that sang his solo in church to a uh, Ed Sullivan and American Bandstand and Gidget and Dick Clark and all kinds of stuff. So I had fun writing it. I went through trunks of memorabilia, photos and concert programs and billboard mm. ads. And uh, it was a great experience reliving it all. It was really thrilling. That That is awesome. Yeah, I'll be looking forward to that. Uh, I was curious, do you think that the four preps will make it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Never. <laughs> Never. And if they, if they, if they nominated us, which they won't, because we're not rock and roll in any way, if they nominated us, I would do a Dolly Parton and say, no way. I mean, that's not respectful to rock and roll. But, you know, I have two daughters who had a very successful, well, they, don't, they don't call themselves rock and roll either. They were alternative rock. Yeah. Very successful band in the U.K., 
And uh, she said, yeah, they keep calling us rock and roll. We're not rock and roll. We're, we're, uh, we're alternative rock. And she said, if anybody ever calls the four press rock and roll, tell them that's not rock and roll. And she's right, it isn't rock and roll. I mean, it's like putting me in the Cowboy Hall of Fame. I'm not a cowboy. So, I mean, I, would, I would, guess I would be honored, but I certainly would, would not think it would be appropriate. And I don't expect it to happen. <laughs> what about putting uh, Weekend Warriors out on Blu-ray? I don't know about that. I know it's available. We've downloaded it before, so uh, I know it's available online in some some way, shape, or form. I don't know much about that tech stuff. My wife does. But uh, I, it is available. As I say, some friend of mine queued it up the other day and watched it. I have fr fans who notify me on the website about having just watched it and you know is that really true or all that really happened so it has a bit of a fan following it's weird yeah i mean i mean it's got you know jack lemon's son chris lloyd bridges vic tayback i mean it's got it's got a, a, a an interesting cast there you know oh yeah oh absolutely and how about lloyd bridges i couldn't believe when bert Tommy calls you're never gonna guess who I got to play the lead officer. I said, you know, I got Lloyd Bridges. Oh, well, I knew his comedy from Airport, you know, and some of those. Airplane, you know, yeah. I mean, I was just blown. You got the <laughs> Lloyd Bridges? Oh, he was great. Lloyd Bridges, what a beautiful man. God, no wonder his sons are so spectacular. He, he just so kind, so down to earth, would not let you, you know, be in any way intimidated by him or whatever. He just, he was terrific. I, I, I just admired him enormously. Yeah. Well, Bruce, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. And like I said, yeah, I'm looking forward to that book coming out, and then maybe we can talk again when it does. I would like that, Tommy. I, I, I must tell you, I do a lot of these, and you really did your homework and asked good questions, and I, I appreciate it. You, uh, it's, it's a bit of delight, and feel free to let's do it again. I'm going to get you that newsletter. Yeah. Anybody listening, BruceBelland.com. Check it out. You might have some fun with the oldies. <laughs> being one of them. And, and I appreciate your work, sir. Thank you so much, and have yourself a great, great day. Thank you, Tommy. Good talking to you, pal. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Bruce Belland. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, what a nice man, huh? And great conversation we had about his amazing career. And I'm so happy that we did it. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying... There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.